Yo, welcome into to another episode. It's Capturing the Game, the Game Within the Game podcast featuring me, your host, Desmond Jones. I'm a man, it's the one and only, Juwan Polo Man Stewart. Today we got another episode, you already know what it is. But before we get into it, I want to remind the audience and listeners and subscribers that Capturing the Game podcast is presented by Capture Sports Agency, where the CEO and founder is Shantel Smith-Jones. Now that we got most of the introductions out the way, let's go ahead and talk about today's guest. Today's guest is the writer for Beyond the W and Prep Girl Hoops out of South Carolina. His name is Hakeem Balaam. Hakeem, how's it going, man? What's going on? Everything's pretty good. Everything's pretty good. Uh, you've probably been watching a lot of Weather Channel as of late. So uh, so we've been, you know, we've been getting a lot of bad weather as of late. But uh, but um, yeah, actually, I'm in Columbia, South Carolina. The area that we're in is not necessarily seeing all that much snow. It's just, you know, more freezing rain more so than anything else. But uh, but, you know, outside of these weather issues, I'm I'm straight for the most part. Yeah, we say welcome to the Midwest because we get normally get that every year. Oh, uh, I can actually, so far. Yeah, that's nothing for us. That's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually hey. a native of New York, so it's one of those things where oh, I so you used to it. Like, yeah, you used yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's nothing for me. <laughs> so what part of yeah. New York are you originally from? Uh, the island, Long Island, Suffolk County. Uh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Six yeah. Years, and I miss it though. Uh, what, what do you miss the most about it? I don't know. It's just, you know, it's kind of hard to describe. Like, you know, it's one of those things where I've kind of, um, you know, I've kind of adopted being in South Carolina as sort of a third home for me outside of New York and outside of Atlanta, which is where I, you know, went to school. I went to school at Georgia State University. But, um, but it's one of those things that I think that just the whole New York area, it's just a very energetic vibe, like from, you know, all the people there to everybody getting on trains and just, just the vibe of the place. I just think it's something that I just miss. And, you know, even going back to my Georgia state days, one thing about me is that I feed off that type of energy. So it's, you know, it's just something that I just, you know, kind of miss. And I'm definitely, you know, I definitely want to, uh, you know, get back there one day to definitely experience it. He couldn't make it here. (laughs) <laughs> you you don't think you're making me? No, 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 no. He couldn't make it for Wayne. No, no. Are you sure? I'm sure. You sure? Uh, <laughs> no, you probably. I'm, I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give you the benefit of that. Yeah, you probably could. You probably could, but we not like the night like, like a New York style. We just that's not that's not our that's not our thing. We more of a laid back city. So we probably be more yeah. like the South Carolinas or yeah, uh-huh. you know, the suburbs of you know, something chill, nothing crazy. People not always going fast paced, but if you live downtown, possibly you'll get a little glimpse of it, but not the same. No. (laughs) I feel like that in many ways, it's kind of something where when you get, when you've gotten used to a certain place for a while, then it sort of becomes you. But it's one of those things where I think that when you've been in a lot of, you know, large areas that have a very big population, I think it's one of those things where after a certain period of time, you know, like I said, you kind of, you know, you kind of get used to it. And there can be a little bit of culture shock when you move to someplace like South Carolina, or even where you're at in Indiana, you know, it's not really, you know, where there's, you know, I won't say there's nothing going on, but it's something right, right. just, it's, you know, it's just the, it's just a different vibe altogether. That, that's fair. I mean, look, yeah. look, so I'll put it this way. I think he would, he, I think he would do just fine, but I really believe he'll love Karen, like covering some of the women's hoops, you know, and oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Like I love basketball is huge here. I would say basketball yeah. is huge here. Yeah. Big time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely heard like, you know, and, and, and one thing about, about me is that I've had the privilege of being able to work in some really big, you know, basketball states. I mean, I'm in South Carolina right now and South Carolina kind of has a little bit of a reputation for being more of a football centric state. But I think that because of what Dawn Staley has done with the U of SC Gamecocks program is that it's kind of elevated you know, girls basketball across the state. And that's what I've been, you know, been able to do for the last few years. But I've had the privilege of being able to work in some really basketball centric states. Like I've done some work in Kentucky before at the Louisville Courier Journal newspaper. I've done work in North Carolina before, which is, you know, kind of right up there. 
uh, with Indiana as far as like being the basketball state in the country. So it's, uh, you know, so I've had the chance to really like, you know, really work in some pretty big hoop states. And thus is the reason why I believe he would do just fine in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yeah, you might be right. <laughs> you might be right. I'll, I'll leave it be. I'll leave it be. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, you know, and, you know, it kind of is one of those things where I'm sort of, you know, just trying to keep myself open to anything and everything. Like, you know, if I, um, you know, if it's something where I end up moving to Fort Wayne, Indiana, then, you know, one of these days, then by all means, um, you know, I was, you know, when I was in Louisville, Kentucky, not too long ago, I was only a few uh, hours away from Fort Wayne. So, um, you know, so it is, in fact, I was literally right across the, right across the Ohio River from Indiana. So it's, uh, you know, so it definitely works from that standpoint. Oh, yeah, it definitely does. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead, you know, kickstart this off. You know, we kind of kickstarted, you know. Um, you know, Keem, go ahead, tell the audience a little bit about yourself so they can know who you are. No problem, no problem, absolutely. And forgive me if I get a little bit long-winded. <laughs> but um, but uh, but yeah, I'm a graduate, I'm a I'm a I'm a Long Island, New York native. Uh, I've lived in several states for throughout my life, you know, New York, Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, uh, Kentucky. Uh, I'm a graduate of uh, Georgia State University. I graduated in 2015. I worked at the school newspaper, The Signal. Shout out to The Signal in Georgia State. And, um, you know, I graduated from there in 2015. And then um, after a period of time, I started uh, doing some freelance work up for the Independent Tribune, which is in Concord, North Carolina, and, you know, covered some of the, uh, you know, some of the teams there. I even got the chance to even cover the, uh, the 2018 Coca-Cola 600, as well as the NASCAR All-Star Race, and, uh, you know, got to ask some questions of, um, of Kyle Busch, who I believe won the uh, I forgot if he won the the 600 that year or the All Star race. I got to go back and see, but um, but yeah, I did a little bit of work up there. I um, I worked for a little bit as a digital producer at the Louisville Courier Journal, which I worked a lot uh, under their uh, you know at their sports department and did a lot of work in collaboration with uh the um with 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 somebody who they refer to as Mrs. Sporting News, Raina Cash, who's now at the Charlotte Observer. And, um, you know, after that, I came back to South Carolina and, uh, you know, did some work now doing work as far as covering the high school scene um, with uh, Prep Girls Hoop South Carolina. And, uh, and at, also, in addition, I've done a lot of work covering the WNBA for Beyond the W. Um, I've been with Beyond the W, which is, uh, you know, which is run by uh, um, um, Laureen Edwards. And, um, and I've been pretty much doing that ever since uh, 2016. So, um, so I'm, you know, it's one of those things where I'm sort of, you know, definitely well rounded. And on top of everything else, um, me and a few of my, a few of my dudes from Georgia State, we started this podcast called the A-League podcast. And we have a lot of uh, episodes uh, of, uh, of that pod on, um, you know, on our, on our SoundCloud page. So, uh, so definitely one of those things where over the years, I've just, you know, become, you know, just very well-rounded as far as my career. And even personally, like I have, you know, I come from a pretty big family. We're really spread out all over the country. Seven brothers, three sisters, um, so many nieces and nephews. So it's uh, definitely one of those things that, uh, you know, I come from a very well-rounded background. That's some, a lot of stuff. That's, that's good, though. That's that's good. But I guess let's start. Let's start with the I guess NASCAR, that's, that's something I would say that's new for us, Desmond. We haven't had a, someone said they cover something in NASCAR. So I'm I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a dive on this one since, you know, I know a little bit about NASCAR myself. But okay. um, how was that, you know, working? Kyle Busch did win the Coca-Cola 600. I did look it up just while you were talking. Mm -hmm. But uh, right. it was the 600. Um, so how was that working with just interviewing and going through that process? Like, how was it? It was very new. Uh, I look back at that, you know, I look back on everything and I think that that was uh, that was very new uh, because uh, that was one of the first like major like major professional sports that I remember like really covering um, after I had graduated and I didn't necessarily know what I was getting into like when I first uh, you know, when I first agreed to, you know, to cover it, because, you know, that's, you know, that that's Concord, North Carolina, um, you know, 
NASCAR is very big in that part of the country, obviously, the Charlotte area. And, you know, like I said, it was one of those things I didn't necessarily know what I was getting myself into when I decided to, you know, when I decided to, okay, because I got a call from my um, from my editor at the time, Jamal Horton, and he had asked, you know, okay, Keem, do you want to cover the Coca-Cola 600? Do you want to cover the All-Star Race? So I was like, bet. You know, it was kind of a new thing for me. And plus, I was already, you know, uh, you know, I was I followed NASCAR for a pretty good bit of time. So it was something that was just kind of new for me, just something that was kind of different. Uh, but, you know, when I had, you know, did everything that I did and just covered the race from the, you know, from the press room that they had at Charlotte Motor Speedway, I started, you know, getting in, you know, thinking like, OK, this is, you know, this is something that I may want to do. So I did three races that year. I did the uh, the Xfinity race, I did the All-Star race, and I did the Coca-Cola 600. One thing I will say, though, thinking about that experience and just looking back on that experience is just the, the food that they had at the press room. Like, just thinking about it, like, they really, like, they really threw down. Like, I remember they had, like, mashed potatoes. They had, like, string beans. They had chicken. Like, you want to talk about a press room that came prepared, that is a press room. Other press rooms around the country take some notes from Charlotte Motor Speedway, man. Oh, yeah, I just, I, I just got hungry. Think about the food. Nah, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I feel like like I'm, cover, cover a race at Indiana, don't you? Yeah, I'm over here thinking about the spread. Like, yo, I wouldn't be. I was see. My problem is, I would eat the food and I'd be in the corner sleep somewhere. Wouldn't even be covering a race. Ah, uh, see, that's oh, the no, you, you can't. <laughs> that, that that's my problem. I already yeah. know. <laughs> I, I can see you now. You had a chicken bone in your mouth, sleep in the corner somewhere. Like, yeah, I just, I just, I just ate sleep, real good. And I can't sleep like this with the lean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It yeah. would be like it would be like say like on on lap fifty after you had already gotten if you're already eaten and everything and then it would be like I don't know say thirty five laps to go and then you wake up like oh who who's who's winning because on yeah. lap fifty it'd probably be like oh Denny <laughs> Hamlin or Kyle Busch and then you wake up like oh Kyle Larson's lapping the field <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's like yeah you missed three accidents uh, the black flag came out they had a postponement you missed all types of stuff everything happened you know. <laughs> Maybe a look, I, on the terrain. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh huh. Look, I, I already know. That's why I know my lanes. You know, that's not one of them. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying. So, so talk to us about, uh, you know, you coming from New York, going to Georgia State. How was that? Like the difference, I mean, I'm assuming cultures are different for sure, because Georgia being Georgia and New York being New York. Speak to that a little bit. How was how's that experience translating for you going across? Well, it you know, it definitely was culture shock. Like I actually had moved. Um, I actually had moved out of New York when I was six years old. So, mm. you know, even though it's one of those things that I will definitely always rep the 631, it's one of those things where I feel like that because of the fact that I've spent so much time in the Southeast between my time in Kentucky, my time in Georgia, my time in South Carolina, by the way, Kentucky is a Southeastern state. Let's just put that out there just for the record. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I feel like that between my time, like in, you know, in all these places, including Texas, I think it's, you know, I think that, you know, when I went to, you know, when I had made the decision to go to Georgia state, it was really something that was you know, that was kind of a, a little bit more of an easier transition because at the time after I graduated from Alexander High School, it was really one of those situations where I was thinking like, oh, let me try, you know, let me try and find myself a job. And then I had had a little bit of an epiphany where I was like, okay, like, you know, it's, it's something where I really wanted to, um, where I really wanted to, you know, go to college. So, at first, I went to a JUCO school. At first, I went to West Georgia Technical College. Then I met a really, you know, a really special friend um, who, um, you know, who also was a journalism major at Georgia State. And she had pretty much encouraged me 
to go to Georgia State because it was one of those things where I had had a YouTube channel where I was talking about sports. I was talking about, you know, radio because I'm a pretty big radio nerd as well. So what happened was um, I decided to, you know, go to Georgia State based off of her advice. And it's one of those things where I look back on it and I just think like, you know what, that was the best decision that I ever made in my life. But long story short, it wasn't necessarily all that much of a daunting transition. And then I also feel like it would, it would have probably been, you know, even just thinking about the cultures, I feel like it probably would have been a bit more of a daunting transition if I was going from, say, New York City to, say, Georgia Southern or Macon, or even, or even UGA, shout out to the world, to the uh, uh, national champion dogs. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but I feel like it's one of those things that would have been a little bit more of a, of a, of a transition, because when you think about it, Georgia State is downtown Atlanta. There are so many people that are in the Atlanta area that are from New York. Like I text my buds all the time and everything about like whenever the Nets play the Hawks at State Farm Arena or whenever the, the Knicks play the Hawks at State Farm Arena. And I always talk about like, oh, what's the ratio of Hawks fans to Knicks fans that's going to be in the joint because there's so many New Yorkers down there in Atlanta. So I think it's, you know, it's a little bit, it was a little bit of an easier transition. And I think that even if it was directly from New York to Atlanta, I feel like it would have been an easier transition just because of, you know, Atlanta is one of those places where you look at Atlanta now and you look at it 25 years ago, it's not even the same city. So it's, I feel like it's, it, it was a lot more uh, easier um, trans, you know, transition, but, but I really owe everything as far as going to Georgia State and my journalism career to my friend. Shout out to the friend. You know, friends be telling us, you know, what, what to, you know, what to do, right? Sometimes, as long as you have the right, right people around you, that's the, that's the most important part, because you got some yeah. people out there to try to do you wrong. Absolutely. Um, thank, you, thank you, Lizzie Lamb. Absolutely, that's the friend, by the way. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. When you were covering um, NASCAR, was it difficult to, for you being in a space? Because I'm sure, like I'm going to guess, you was probably the only one of your color, you know, in that space, you know, did you ever get side eyes or people wondering like, yo, why is this person here? Did anyone like question, like, you know, your credentials while you was, you know, covering NASCAR for that time period? Well, I imagine looking back on that experience, I imagine that, you know, I probably did maybe get a few side eyes, um, you know, because, you know, like you said, you know, it's, you don't really find that many, uh, you don't really find that many Black uh, NASCAR writers or people that, you know, that had the chance to like cover NASCAR, but, you know, it was, it was kind of also something new when, you know, when thinking about it, but I think one of the things that I always, you know, tried to tell myself throughout my, uh, you know, throughout my career is I belong in this space. That's one of the things that I've always tried to tell myself is if anybody tries to say, I don't belong in a particular space, I will always remind myself, look, I belong here. I belong in a NASCAR space. I belong in, a, in an MLB space. I belong in any sports space or business space that could very well be there. So it's kind of one of those things I just sort of looked at it and said, all right, you know, you want to go ahead and hate? Fine. Go ahead and hate. You're going to learn to appreciate. So, you know, that's just kind of a, you know, an attitude that I've always, you know, that I've always taken. And, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, I'm always going to have with me as, you know, as long as I'm here. Preach. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So we kind of talked about a little bit of your journey of how you ended up from point A to point B, but let's, you know, let's talk about like kind of like the heart of almost who you are, you know, what, what made you get interested or be interested in journalism? Mm, uh, that's, you know, that's a good one for sure. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, it's definitely a story because I remember, you know, when I was a teenager, like, you know, around the time that I had moved from Texas to Georgia, um, it was something where I was really like trying to find myself because I had made a lot of friendships when I had gone to, you know, when I had gone to, um, I forgot what the name of the high school is, Side Creek High School, uh, just outside of Houston. And then I went to another school and I was uh, really heartbroken because 
like I said, I had made a lot of friendships, you know, going back to elementary school and we had gone to Side Creek together and I had really wanted to graduate with them. And it was really something that, you know, that kind of just made me, you know, just sort of do a, you know, a re, you know, shuffling of my life. So what ended up happening was upon me moving to Georgia, like right before, like I had started the 11th grade, I started really getting interested in media. I started getting interested in radio. I started getting interested in, you know, researching radio stations, researching, you know, newspapers, researching TV stations, because all of it was so fascinating to me. You know, I, I, it couldn't really help it, but so much of it was just really fascinating to me. And I think that was probably the inspiration behind me starting my YouTube channel where I just started, you know, bantering about all sorts of things related to not just sports, but also the radio and TV and media industries. Nowadays, you know, you can also add obviously podcasts to that as well. But, um, but what ended up happening was, you know, I just knew that I was a, you know, very big into sports, very big into media. So it was kind of one of those things where, you know, I was interested in both but at the same time, I didn't necessarily always have the belief in myself that I could, you know, that I could necessarily pursue it and turn it into a career. So at the time, you know, when I was in the 11th and 12th grade, it was one of those situations where I felt like, okay, maybe I wanted to pursue a career in criminal justice, or maybe I wanted to go ahead and pursue a career in accounting, you know, because I was, you know, people had, you know, really lauded me for being good with numbers. And then I had gone, you know, like I said, to West Georgia Tech. And then, like I said, I met Lizzie. And it's one of those things where, you know, because of the fact that, you know, she had seen so many of my YouTube videos, um, you know, it was something where she had, you know, kind of encouraged me, like I said, to go to Georgia State. And, you know, when I went to Georgia State, I had, um, you know, worked at the uh, sports department at the Signal. I also did a little bit of work for their TV station, their student TV station. And, um, I actually was the sports editor for the year when Georgia State had went to the NCAA tournament and RJ Hunter hit that shot against Baylor and his dad, the coach Ron Hunter fell out of his chair and it just turned into a, you know, a viral moment and one of the biggest moments in the history of college basketball, definitely one of the biggest March Madness moments. So it's just kind of one of those things that I just, you know, sort of look back and just think like, oh, wow, like, you know, how one decision can really and just one person that you can meet that could really give you a belief in yourself can really be that thing that can just kind of just take you so far and I owe it all to that as to why you know as to why I'm where I am right now with my career yeah um I don't even know what to say about that like I think you know well, he said he said bars and there's a, a lot of bars I, I, that I, I know I know <laughs> bars. So you got to digest the bars. You got to digest all the bars. So you still, you know, that's what you're doing. You're digesting the bars. That's what <laughs> Understandable. It is. You know what I'm saying? Mm, yeah, for sure. For sure. And, you know, like I said, it's, uh, you know, it's just kind of one of those things, like I said, it just sort of makes you, you know, it just sort of makes you think and just sort of makes you look back. Cause you know, like I said, you know, it's, you know, sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes it just takes that one move or sometimes it just, you know, takes that one person. Then all of a sudden, before you know it, you know, it's, you know, it can, you know, a little bit can go a long way. And, you know, I, I know sometimes we hear a lot about that, but a little bit can't really go a long way. That That's a hundred percent true. Um, who are some of your, it's on the radio people that you love to follow or, um, you did your research on, or you kind of looked up to as you kind of figured out your career as you went along? <laughs> Well, it's it's interesting because, you know, in the, you know, in the sports space, I would probably definitely have to say Dan Patrick, you know, it's one of those things where I've even had to say probably that, you know, a lot of people have actually came up to me and said that I have a very Dan Patrick type voice. Um, I've gotten that a lot from just people that I've, you know, talked to over the years, um, you know, just had casual conversations with over the years. So definitely that's a, a huge uh, influence of mine. You know, obviously, you know, rest in peace to the goat Stuart Scott definitely you know he's you know you know always going to be a, a in, an influence for me and so many other you know black journalists and journalists of color and also another one I feel like is Bob Costas because of just how in depth he goes uh with his uh you know with his interviews so I feel like that those three 
are, you know, are probably at the top of my list, but also it's, you know, it's one of those things where I've, you know, over the years, I've also looked up to a lot of women journalists, you know, the, the Linda Cones of the world. So it's, you know, it's one of those situations where I think that, you know, over the years, I've definitely had my fair share of, uh, you know, my fair share of influences. And, you know, even, you know, some of my fair share of influences, even outside of the, um, outside of the sports radio realm. I mean, one of my, you know, favorite radio hosts, you know, outside of sports is, you know, is, you know, is probably Michael Baisden. And I know he isn't necessarily doing a show anymore, but when you talk about like black radio hosts, I feel like that, that, you know, he's, you know, definitely, you know, either at or close to the top of the list as far as that's concerned. So I've, you know, I've had my fair share of influences and I've definitely tried to model my style as far as like when I do podcasts or when I do broadcasting based off that, while at the same time also trying to insert my own flair into everything. Definitely yeah. says some some big name, you know, some goats as as especially in the journalist world. They like, you know, the Linda Cones, uh, Stuart Scotts and Dan Patrick, especially those two alone just were, I mean, iconic. And there still are. I mean, you know, even though rest in peace Stuart Scott, but like you said, they're definitely iconic in their their own right. Um yeah, I mean, um I'm trying to think of some other ones that I guess are I guess big in the in the realm now. I mean, you got a lot of younger ones are coming up that are, you know, really making strides. I'm trying to think of some names though. I can't really think of anybody right now. It's great. Desmond, help me out. I need I need some help. Maria Taylor. Yeah, I I, I, I yeah, Maria Taylor of the world. You yeah, got Maria the, Taylor. Um, um I mean Jamel Hill's been around for a while, but she's prolific in her own right. Um Joy Taylor. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. definitely newer she's she's been around but she's she's starting to get her footing i would say for sure mm -hmm. um, for real for real absolutely absolutely yeah. and yeah, i think I'll... that yeah I, I think that's you know it's one of those things where i think that because of the fact that now we're seeing you know the rise of you know just so many you know so many black journalists another one is right. ross gold on wood a um, mm -hmm. I think that because of the fact that we're seeing, you know, so many, I think it's one of those things where even, you know, those of us that may very well be um, established and have been in the game for a little bit, it's kind of one of those things that I've always taken the approach that, you know, we're always learning. And sometimes it's one of those situations where we see, you know, you know, we see our peers and we think like, oh, wow, like maybe we want to, you know, model our own style, you know, probably after them. So it just, you know, it just depends, you know, it just, it just works out all together. Right. Yeah. For me, um, some of the people that I looked up to, um, other than like some of the big names you guys mentioned, uh, one of the people that I look up to is his name is uh, Lawrence Holmes. I uh, call him Loho. He works at uh, 670 to score out of Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's one of my favorite people I love listening to. Um, just the interviews that he gives, the uh, how personal he can be and how he can still keep his fan side in check, but still be diligent in a lot of the different episodes that he has. So that's someone I try to model my style off of after. Another person for me that's close to the heart is, uh, his name is Jason Goff. He um, does the Full Go podcast on Spotify right now with uh Bill Simmons, Bill Dollar Simmons, that's what he calls them. And um, there's, a whole, there's a, whole, uh, a couple of other people. So there's some of the people that I that I love to enjoy um, to listen to. I remember, um, uh, I, I think it was earlier in 2021, uh, one of um, one of Lawrence Holmes, um, one of his um, his show segments uh, that he was doing, I think he was talking about the Bears. And it was one of those situations where I was listening to it. And there was a portion in that um, where he was, you know, where he was like really going in. And one of the things he said about it was he was like, he deserves no sympathy from you. He deserves no cookie from you. <laughs> I think he was talking about the Bears front office and everything like that. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, they just did a reshuffling of their front office because they just got rid of Matt Nagy and uh, Ron Pace. But um, but yeah, you know, definitely a lot of the uh, a lot of the local ones as uh, you know, as well, are definitely those to, you know, to look up to those are some good ones. Yeah, he he died. I remember exactly that because this is like the day after they uh, came back and say, yeah, you know, they bring in Pace back they bring in Nagy, Nagy back. And um, 
they and they had that press conference and i'm not even gonna talk about the last press conference that they just had when you know the cassie <laughs> came out and he called out the players uh, as a liar this it was so, it's so how much you know they talk about jeff dickerson you know, and on this kid and how uh he shamed high school students uh, i mean i ain't gonna talk about that because so many other people in the media have already talked about that but a lot of that that whole press conference rubbed me the wrong way so but yes, a big shout out to any of the local media people that are covering teams or and actually uh, doing a big, uh, big shout out to them because they deserve as much shine as the people that are, you know, nationally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt, without a doubt. And you know, like I said, there's so many, you know, like I said, to look up to. Another one, um, another one that is definitely one of my favorites is uh, is a uh, home team Brandon Leak. Uh, in Atlanta at 680 the fan you know and and I know um, you know I've met him a couple of times and um, I know him as well because uh, he actually used to do um, color commentary for Georgia State radio for football and basketball so shout outs to him as well big shout out big big shout out any spot any uh I said podcast any podcast that you're you're you love listening to right now um well you know it's it's one of those it's one of those those situations where, um, you know, over the years, like I'll just go ahead and I'll just listen to like a lot of times what will happen is that a lot of these radio shows, they'll just go ahead and they'll upload their um, they'll upload like snippets of their shows in the podcast format. But, you know, it's really one of those situations where, you know, sometimes I have to kind of, you know, find the time to actually, you know, you know, sit down and listen to a few podcasts because, you know, it's, it's something where really and truly I live a life on the go. Like I'm, you know, typically, you know, going to a lot of high school games, you know, whether it's girls basketball, boys basketball, and plus I do a lot of, you know, just, you know, interstate travel and everything. So it's, you know, really one of those situations where sometimes I'll have to go ahead and, you know, sometimes just sort of find the time to listen to podcasts. I, you know, that's one of the things that I really want to do more in 2022 is I really want to just, you know, try to find that time and fit that time in my schedule. Maybe I should do it during one, one of my upcoming, you know, interstate drives. But it's one of those things where I'm just, you know, trying to find that time to really just, you know, sit down and just kind of absorb a few podcasts for the time being. Yeah, I Definitely think makes sense. Yeah, I think it's been hard to really consume podcasts, especially with the way the world changes, the whole work from home philosophy and stuff like that. Because most of the time, most of the consumption of podcasts normally takes place when people are traveling. And if people are working from home or not traveling as much, you know, the podcasts kind of just don't get consumed, you know, um, you know. But not to mention, too, I mean. You know, sorry to cut you off, Justin, but no, go ahead. you know, you got to look at the, the just the grand scheme eco of podcasts have changed because before, you know, five, 10 years ago, or even you go back two, three years ago, podcasts weren't really like it was it was a thing, but it wasn't like once COVID hit, it was like podcasts like went on an uptick. Like everybody got a podcast at this point, no matter who you are. You can make a podcast at any point in the time of day you want which is good. I'm not saying it's not a good thing, but you've now, the, the market of podcasts is almost oversaturated in a lot of regards. You got a lot of the same content out there, a lot of different, you know, different ways and angles of looking at it. So, I mean, you got so much, so much podcast information, which is good, but it's a lot to consume if you want to just sit down and just be like, you know what, I'm going to listen to this podcast, that podcast, this podcast. And then you're like, oh, they got another one that's even better than that one. Like, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. And I've, I understand. So I get you a full, full, full heart a little now. I understand. <laughs> I just got into like looking at other podcasts. It's like, eh, I guess I'm gonna sit down and watch. I play in the game. I'm like, eh, okay, I could just listen to this on the side while I'm playing or whatever. You know, it just mm-hmm. it's a lot. But you're talking two hours of content. You like eh, that's one episode. Geez, that's not that episode been on for a long time. But it's funny though. Like it's great. It's cool. But yeah, geez, I need another podcast to listen to. So I get you. I definitely get you. But go ahead, Desmond. Continue. I mean, no, nah, you you pretty much finished the rest of the statement. Like, you know, <laughs> like, the, like the way that people consume and listen to the podcasts and then the amount of podcasts and stuff that's out there is crazy. Like, and yeah, and, and see, the thing is, the, the thing is, there is a podcast nowadays for literally everything. anything and yeah. everything like <laughs> it just doesn't have to it just doesn't have to be sports or anything right. like you know pop culture like 
it's, you know, you could just pick up a random, you could just pick out a random topic, like say, I don't know, um, shower curtains. There's probably a podcast <laughs> somewhere out there for shower curtains or say, you know, vacuums. There's probably a podcast out there for vacuums. So, or, yeah. or even landscape, there's a podcast literally out there for everything. So it's good, but it's also, like you said, man, it's one of those things where, you know, the, the podcast, you know, ecosystem has been kind of, you know, just so um, saturated to the point where it's like, oh, what, what is there out there to listen to? So it's kind of a good and bad problem to have. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I okay. totally agree. You got murder mystery podcasts. It's like, I thought that was just a radio thing. They even got podcasts. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. Exactly. Is that murder on a podcast? That sounds that sounds dangerous. <laughs> yeah. That sounds more than dangerous. Sort of, it sort of goes back to, you know, because like I said, I'm a student of radio and it sort of goes back to, you know, when you was talking about like murder mystery podcasts, it sort of yeah. goes back to the old days when they used to literally have like, you know, you know, radio shows that used to be like, you know, how they used to do like TV shows, uh, but they used to be like just radio shows before they invented TV. So it's kind of going back to that in a sense. Yeah. Good for those who do a lot of traveling, though, like yours truly. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Mm. It's, it's, it's a lot that's out there. <laughs> <laughs> no question it's, about it. Yeah. Um. So, so let's shift gears a little bit. So how did you like end up working for beyond a W. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, you know, after I had graduated from Georgia state, um, it was one of those situations where I'd actually kind of decided to take a little bit of a break because I just felt like my senior year, you know, between classes and, you know, doing the work that I was doing for the school's newspaper. Um, it was just one of those situations where I just kind of felt like, you know, I need to take a, I need a little bit of a breather. So I took a few months breather before I started like really trying to put myself, you know, out there trying to find my, you know, some postgraduate work. And, you know, one of those days, it was just something where I was just kind of, um, you know, just sort of, you know, searching for, you know, just sort of, I just did a Google search. I just did a Google search for, you know, any, you know, internet places out there that may be looking for writers. And then, I came across this one listing, um, this one search listing for this um, one website called Beyond the W, because they had, you know, they had a listing where it was like, okay, you know, bloggers wanted or writers wanted or something like that. And I had always been fascinated by the idea of covering the WNBA because it was, you know, it was one of those things where I was just, you know, like I said, I kind of had my eyes on it a little bit, um, even when I was, um, you know, even when I was in school at Georgia State. So I figured like, okay, you know, let me, you know, let me give this a shot. So, um, you know, so I put in, you know, so I put in an application, you know, me and Lorene had a, you know, and we call her Lo, me and Lo had the, you know, had a little bit of a chat. And, and then it was one of those things where, you know, I just kind of started, you know, I just started writing and things just sort of took off from there. It's kind of, you know, fitting though, that, you know, one of my um, first gigs ends up being a WNBA job because it's one of those situations. I remember I have an older sister who lives in um, who lives in uh, North Carolina, and um, she actually watched the WNBA. Her name is Lorraine, by the way. Uh, <laughs> she actually watched the uh, the WNBA in its early days, so she knows like the OGs of the W. You know, the Lisa Leslies, the the, the Teresa Weatherspoons, like the Cheryl Swoops, the, the Becky Hammonds of the world. Uh, shout out to Becky Hammond, just got that coach job with the, with the Las Vegas Aces. But, um, but, you know, it's kind of, you know, fitting that, you know, I had that because I have a little bit of a background, family background, and then I end up, you know, you know writing, you know, as a, as a WNBA writer for Beyond the W. And, you know, it's just kind of taken off from there because, um, you know, it was one of those situations where I'd even checked out some of their content that they had there and they had done some, you know, and she had done some WNBA um, interviews with a few WNBA players. I think she had interviewed um, Tamika Catchings, Maya Moore, um, you know, so some greats of the W. And, you know, then I kind of came in and sort of added my own, you know, my own bit to it. And, you know, it just sort of took off from there. But, you know, it's, one of those things where even looking back on it, you know, you always start from somewhere like, you know, it was, 
it was something where I look back on those early days where I was like, okay, I was misspelling some player names. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I was kind of misspelling player names and stuff like that. And then, you know, eventually I kind of, you know, I kind of, you know, just sort of did my own research and things like that. But, but yeah, I had, I, I would have had no idea just looking back on six years ago, you know, just doing a Google search and deciding to, you know, do this beyond the W thing where it would have taken me. Now it's one of those situations wherever I, when it, where whenever I post something on my Twitter account, you know, about the WNBA, it's one of those things where it kind of gets its fair share of retweets and likes. So it's, uh, it's amazing how far one can go in six years. Amen for growth. Cause, um, yeah, especially when, you know, it's fun when you can look back and look at stuff and be like, dang, I used to do that, you know, and, and you realize where you at today, uh, just the evolution, the uh, dedication, first and foremost, and also the, just the discipline to evolve over the time, especially learn and grow, like, you know, big shout out to you. Um, since this is my first time getting to know you, I definitely, you know, when it's all said and done, I'm going to go ahead and read and, and, and catch up with, with everything, you know, pay attention to uh, to your writings and stuff. But, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask was, you know, what was some of your favorite stories that you've written over the course of these past six years? Um, I've, you know, I, too many to name. Like, how much time do we got? Um, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've done a few things. Like, you know, I've done a few things. I've, you know, done some, um, you know, I've done some interviews in the past. Like I remember a couple of times I did, uh, you know, in my early days when I was with Beyond the W, um, I did interviews with a few people out in San Francisco. Um, you know, I had this series, I had this thing going on, I called it Where to W. And it was one of those things where I was kind of like, you know, I was interviewing people in local cities, um, in local markets, um, to talk about what would happen if the WNBA were to expand. Now, I know Commissioner Engelbert recently came out and said, we're trying to like, you know, get the health of our 12 teams under, you know, under control before we do expand, but we will expand. And, you know, WNBA Twitter just, you know, it's one of those things where all you got to do is mention the word expansion to WNBA Twitter, and they just start lighting up with, you know, it, 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 it stars in their, in their eyes. So, I did some, you know, I talked to some people in San Francisco in the Bay Area to talk about, you know, the potential of, you know, of a team, you know, coming to the Bay Area. And there's actually an effort out in Oakland to do so. Uh, I talked to some people out in Philadelphia about, you know, you know, the possible impact of maybe a WNBA team, you know, coming there. And, you know, it's been one of those situations where I definitely thought a lot about you know, restarting that where to W series where I talk to maybe people in Miami, or I talk to people in Toronto, or I talk to people in Charlotte. And, you know, so I definitely think that those were or Houston, um, of course, they had the Houston Comets, the original dynasty. So, um, so I definitely, you know, thought about doing that. And, you know, I think another one of my favorite stories I actually done, you know, this past year, when I had the chance to interview um, Callie Rivers Curry, uh, who is at, um, who's an executive at uh, CAA Sports and is also the wife of uh, Seth Curry. So, um, you know, that was a very in-depth conversation that we had, you know, just talking about, you know, being a Black woman in sports media, or rather in sports business, uh, how she wanted to be in sports media, but eventually transitioned into sports business and, you know, just how her family, you know, and everything has been affected by COVID and, you know, moving from Dallas to Philly. That was a really, um, you know, good interview as well. I even had the chance one time to even interview Dawn Staley for one of my, um, for one of my stories that I've done there. So, um, so I've done a lot, I've written a lot of columns. And one thing, you know, for sure that I've done a lot of is that, I've done a lot of depth as far as columns. Like it could be one of those situations where I could be talking about like, you know, hey, why is Marianne Stanley the coach of the Indiana Fever? And then the next moment I could be talking about like, you know, just, you know, the impact of, you know, you know, the WNBA's, you know, um, you know, their efforts as far as, you know, social justice. So it's really one of those things that, you know, I've just done a real good depth of, uh, of, of columns and everything like that. And 
one thing that I definitely, you know, from an on-court standpoint that I'm, you know, in fact, two things. Uh, number one, covering the 2018 All-Star Game in Minnesota, first time ever going to an All-Star Game. And then also having it be one of those things where, um, you know, where me and Lo really went in depth as far as covering the sale and the eventual transition of the New York Liberty from James Dolan to Joe Psy, because we actually first broke the story that when they were going to be playing in Westchester in 2018, we had that first. So it was one of those situations where just covering that whole thing that they was going through and then eventually, you know, transitioning to where they're at at Barclays Center. That's one of those, another one of those uh, stories that, you know, I'm definitely proud that, you know, we was able to get out there. Well, let me ask you this as a, a journalist, a writer, blogger, have you ever had that moment where you were that, uh, maybe shouldn't put this one out or, mm, I don't know how this one's going to go across to the masses. Have you ever had that moment of just indecisiveness about a project or about, you know, a piece of, you know, a piece a column or a piece in general that you were like, eh, this may be a little edgy for whatever the message is, or this may be maybe a little off with this one. Right, I'm just, I'm just writing this to write it and see what happens. See, the thing is, whenever, whenever I decide to put something out, I go all in with it. Like whenever I decide to, you know, do something, you know, I put my everything into my writing, whether it's, you know, whether it's writing or whether it's um, something to do on the, you know, on the broadcasting side of things or the podcasting side of things. Like I always try to maintain a confidence in anything that I do. And one thing that I have discovered, you know, over the years is, you know, to, to not be scared is to just, you know, go just all in with anything and everything. And one thing that I've also discovered is that whenever I have had a, it was it, whenever it was one of those things where I decided to put something out and maybe I had a little bit of hesitation about it. Sometimes those are really the, those are really the pieces that really ends up doing the best as far as, you know, engagement. So it's really one of those things that I think I just have to always just sort of keep that in mind, um, you know, whenever I put something out there. And I think it's also one of those things that I think it, you know, it helps for a website like Beyond the W, because one thing about it is that, you know, you have your websites out there like the Next and Swish Appeal um, that, you know, cover a lot of the traditional X's and O's when it comes to women's basketball. But one of the things that, we've really done is we've really tried to put a lot of emphasis on what the players of the WNBA are doing away from the court, like what businesses that they may very well be starting or what, you know, after, you know, what initiatives that they may want to do in the community or what they may have planned um, after their playing days or, you know, what their interests in as far as like, you know, especially as far as, um, music is concerned like one of the things that I know that um Lo just recently did was that um you know that we, we did an interview with um with Epiphany Prince and you know we had talked about you know a lot of her musical influences so it's really one of those situations where I think that because we cover a broader depth of content you know and a broader depth of just everything as opposed to your traditional you know basketball sites it's one of those things where we can take a project and we could be like, okay, you know, we can do something that maybe another site wouldn't necessarily touch because of, you know, just the approach that we've taken to coverage. Yeah. I think that's a excellent business model. Um, just cause of the fact that you can kind of keep your audience's attention throughout the off season versus like once all the X's and O's is over with, you know, it's only, you say the WNBA season lasts five months, you know, once it's, once it's over with now, they got their, they just twiddling their thumbs, you know, maybe, maybe that those, those other sides can participate in talking about the college game, you know, until to the WNBA comes back around. But, you know, I think that's an excellent business model to especially cover athletes um, on and off the court. Um, Cause I feel as though a lot of athletes have a lot of initiative that goes on off the court that people just don't really know about. So yeah, I, you know, mm -hmm. I commend, you know, what you guys are doing over at the, at the, at the, beyond the W. 
Absolutely. And, and see, the thing is, one thing that uh, another great thing that I think we, you know, that is great is the fact that we all have, you know, we all have our strengths as far as like what we can, you know, what we can cover, like, you know, our editor in chief low, like she's, you know, big on, you know, culture, she's big on, you know, you know, she's big on fashion, you know, so that's, you know, kind of her lane. I know that I'm big on, you know, media and arena type deals and everything like that. Like I know the the Seattle Storm this upcoming season will play their first season at Climate Pledge Arena. Uh, so, um, you know, so I may end up doing something a little bit about that. We have uh, one of our photographers. His name is Lamar Carter. Uh, shouts out, big shouts out to him. Like, you know, he, you know, he is a beast on photography. Like I remember one time uh, he was at a Phoenix Mercury New York Liberty game at Barclays Center and he got this real really, really, really fi, you know, picture of, of, uh, of Brittany Griner going in, you know, going in and throwing down for a dunk. Like it's, it's on his Twitter feed, but, but, you know, one of the things that, um, that he's also pretty big on is he's big on, you know, making sure that the WNBA has greater inclusion and features in NBA 2k. So he, that's, you know, that's his lane. And then we have another, um, uh, photographer. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Steph Lavelle out, in, uh, out on the West Coast. So, you know, it's one of those things that we have like a pretty good, you know, bit of, um, you know, it's one of those things where we have a pretty good bit of, um, you know, of uh, talent that we got and we all got our strengths and it all just comes together to make a pretty good product, if you ask me. No, it definitely, it definitely sounds like that, you know, it sounds like the perfect recipe, you know. Um, what so we kind of talked about it um, we didn't really necessarily talk about it a little bit but what what does it mean for the audiences um that may not know but what does it mean to really cover a story like what's some of those things that you have to do you know and also you know leave some tips on what you know what you should do as a journalist to, to really truly cover a story well i think one of the things to you know to definitely remember as far as like really covering stories is, you know, to remember that, you know, you have, you know, some, you know, pretty good sources and some pretty good, you know, interview subjects, because, you know, lots of times I think that sports is, you know, and it may be lesser of a of an occasion as far as sports than it may very well be for other, you know, you know, types of journalism coverage, whether it be news or entertainment, because, you know, a lot of what, you know, gets covered in sports is already like, you know, we know what we're going to cover, you know, whether it's covering games or covering press conferences or covering, you know, signings and things like that. Like, we know what it is that we're going to end up covering. But, you know, I think it's one of those things where I think that even outside of that, I think it's also, you know, just definitely important to, you know, to just maintain those relationships and try to build those relationships, because it really is one of those things that I think can just really be, you know, very, 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 um, you know, critical as far as like being able to cover some of those, you know, cover some of those big stories. And, you know, one thing that I think is really, um, that I think is really important. And one thing that I've tried to, you know, really put an emphasis on is when you think about it, I could really care less about being first to a story. I care more about making sure that all of my information is airtight and that it's accurate. Because we've seen in, you know, we've seen, um, you know, lots of cases, you know, the, and I kind of slick hate to bring this up, but when Kobe Bryant died, uh, it was one of those situations where everybody was, you know, there was, there was a lot of what I like to call journalistic malpractice that was going on. Because, you know, I think there were so many people out there that was trying to be first to the details as instead of being accurate with the details. So, you know, I just kind of look back on that and I just kind of think like, you know, if somebody else, you know, gets to certain details before me, fine, it is what it is. But I think it's one of those situations where I think that as long as, you know, you have those, you know, as long as you have those relationships and as long as you're able to just make sure that all of your information is, you know, is correct, then I think it's one of those situations that, you know, you can come out with a, uh, with a pretty accurate story. And then on top of everything else, just thinking about it in the sense of, you know, you know, sometimes it'll be something where certain stories, you know, it may take a few days to kind of get, you know, all the details as far as the story is concerned. So, you know, I think it's just one of those situations where it's just kind of all about exercising, you know, just, you know, good journalistic judgment. And when you do that, you know, it's one of those situations where it maintains, 
trust among those who you work with to get stories. And it also maintains a certain modicum of trust as far as those who read your work. Because, you know, it's one of those things where you have your reputation is all that you got. And if it's something where, you know, you end up blowing one's reputation, then everybody's going to look at you and start to think like, okay, like, you know, what else is out there? So it's really one of those things that that's very important to protect. Yeah. I, um, I think about, I just think about the whole Kobe thing, you know, um, you know, it, it, it was, you know, shocking and unbelievable at times and, you know, concerns on whether it's true, not true. And then finally when it's all, you know, said and done, it became true, unfortunately, you know, I think about that. I think about, uh, even recently with their like uh the whole super thing how they uh she uh, said that they're gonna bring her back and then like according to the rules they can't really officially say that because you know mm -hmm. contracts and free agency doesn't start to xyz date so i i think about all those types of things that goes on behind journalism and i think that in the in the sue bird case i feel like that was that was more of a case, I think, of just, you know, like I said, just more social media type thing. But, you know, I feel like that that's I feel like that's one of those situations where I sort of look back at just how that happened. And I think like, oh, wow, like when when the Seattle storm actually can officially announce that Sue Bird is coming back for one more year. Oh, you know, for sure, their social media is going to have something like really, really good plans. Like, and that's really how you know how to use social media, because it's one of those things where it's like, OK, you know, we may have screwed up here. We're going to outdo ourselves this time. So I think they got something planned for when they can actually announce it now. Oh, yeah, I, I believe that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I can, I can just I can just see it now. Like, OK, like, let's let's try this again for real now. Run it back. Sue Bird come back for one more year. It'll be, and I'm glad it? she's coming back for that one more year because she deserves a she deserves a farewell tour. And I can only imagine because see, Sue Bird's a native of Long Island. So when the storm go to play the Liberty, oh, you know she is going to get a hero's welcome because you know Sue Bird, New York. So you know you know how New York is. Oh yeah, I I know. Trust me, it's, yeah. it's going to be. The no tickets probably already sold out already. Oh, they, if they ain't sold out by now, they need to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I, that I want to go back to and talk about a little bit, what's some of the hardest aspects to, of writing? Uh, I think some of the, the hardest aspects of writing, I think that um, one of them is kind of just figuring out exactly like, you know, what to, you know, what to write about and also how you're going to write it because I remember, in fact, I just did this. I was, um, you know, it was one of those situations where I had written one of my Beyond the W columns. Um, and it was basically in response to that New York Times piece that was put out by, you know, Erica Ayala. Shout outs to Erica, uh, one of the, you know, one of the greats in WNBA media. But, um, but it was one of those things where I had written that piece basically in response to that New York Times piece because Kathy Engelbert had pretty much, you know, said like, look, we want to expand, but we're kind of waiting to get all of our financial ducks in a row. And um, I had written something, you know, I had written something for Beyond the W where it was one of those things where I had, you know, I was coming up with ideas in my mind, but the whole premise of the column was basically, you know, yeah, you don't want to go ahead and expand too quickly. But at the same time, you also don't want to delay expansion. So I was coming up with ideas. And I know that the one idea that it came up in my mind for sure was, you know, the WNBA shouldn't have to go ahead and delay expansion because it's stuck at 12 teams and the National Women's Soccer League, which has not been around, which has only been around for, I think, for like 10 years, as opposed to the WNBA's 26, they're they're expanding and they're now at 12 teams so it was something where I was kind of like trying to figure out ideas as far as um as far as what I want a premise of a piece to be and then how I'm going to go ahead and write it you know sometimes I think that what I probably need to do is I probably need to be better as far as you know if I get an idea for a piece or if I get an idea for an interview um 
you know, coming up with interview questions, just jotting down those interview questions. And if I come up with an idea for, you know, a, you know, for a column or whatever, you know, come up with the main idea. And then it's one of those situations where if something automatically comes up in my brain, just sort of put it somewhere in the notes of my cell phone. So it, it's, it's something where it's just kind of a little bit of a, of a balancing act, but you know, it's something where I think that, you know, just coming up with ideas, that can be the hardest part. And then the second hardest part can be figuring out, like, how you want to write it. Now, I've gotten a lot of praise over, you know, over my years, as far as my, my career, as far as being able to be very creative with how I write in certain topics. But, you know, sometimes that could be one of those situations where every writer can experience writer's block. So sometimes what I will do is if I'm experiencing writer's block is sometimes I'll go ahead and I'll put my computer away for maybe 30 minutes to, to an hour. And then it's one of those situations where after that period of time, I'll then come back to it. And then I think, okay, this is the idea that I've had. And then all of a sudden I'll just put it, put it into words. So, and then another thing about me is that I edit myself while I'm writing. So um, so it's one of those situations where, you know, it's kind of like the whole, the whole writing process can be a lot, but, you know, when you see the finished product, it just makes you think, okay, you know, this is, you know, this is what's, this is what's going on. And it just gives you something to be proud of. Okay. Okay. Um, is that, is that typical where, you know, you, you're your own editor and writer, or do most people just be the writer and they hand it off to someone that is an editor? From what I know, I can only, you know, I can only speak for those that I have had the opportunity to really meet in my career. But for the most part, I think that those that I have met have really been, for the most part, they've just been straight writers. And it's just been something where they've allowed like their editors to go ahead and, you know, kind of, you know, edit their content because I've edited, you know, I've done editing before. Like that was one of the main things that I did when I was in Louisville with the Career Journal. So I've done a little bit of that work before, but, but yeah, I, I, I imagine that most writers are probably just straight writers and probably just leave the, the writing process probably to one of the editors. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm just curious. Cause you know, we don't, we don't really talk to too many writers and editors on, on capture the game. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to ask all the little questions I can ask. Just like... <laughs> <laughs> ask away, ask away. That's what I got to yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. Um, what other types of advice did you have for people that are interested in journalism or people that are interested in writing? You know, what types of advice would you can give back to people? Because I'm um, like, for me, for example, I am um, like my, my, my nephew out there, he's in high school, he's a junior, senior, he loves sports and whatnot. Uh, I think he's in the crossroads where he's trying to figure out, you know, how, what to do with his career. And I'm like, look, man, there's a lot of different avenues in sports. You know, you can either do journalism, writing, you know, editing, like whatever the case, like whatever you want to do is out there. But I know it's I like getting this type of information because I like to educate others on, you know, how people can get started and stuff or just and how to really make it in this industry. So, you know, what, what type of advice could you give to people that are, you know, trying to make it in journalism or people that's working on or wanting to become editors or writers? It's interesting because I'm actually kind of doing that, um, doing that right now with this with this young guy by the name of Avery Wiggins out of uh, out of Atlanta. Um, he's another Georgia State University graduate. Shout outs to him. And uh, we've had a chance to talk and everything. And now he's writing for um, uh, Swish Appeal as well as Prep Red Zone. So shout outs to him. But I think that um, I think that, you know, among the advice that I could very well give is I think, you know, just kind of find your writing style because everybody is different. You know, I think it's one of those situations where sometimes I think a mistake, you know, sometimes that we go ahead and we, you know, we try to do as writers is, you know, yeah, we definitely want to go ahead and we want to try to, you know, find our own style and sort of, you know, try to find models to sort of, you know, emulate that one. And that can be with, you know, writing or with anything. But I think it's one of those situations where it's almost like sometimes we make the mistake of wanting to be a carbon copy of those that we see that we, you know, that we look up to, because even they would probably say, you know, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm grateful for the fact that you look up to me, but at the same time, also develop your own style. So I think it's one of those situations where I think that we kind of have to, you know, do a little bit of that as writers. And I also think um, 
another one of the pieces of advice that I would probably give to anybody is, you know, try to be versatile, you know, because I think that, you know, especially nowadays, you can never be, you know, versatile enough. So I know that one of the things that I remember doing when I was, you know, first starting out was I didn't just want to be a straight up writer. I wanted to make sure that I had, you know, experience, you know, as far as, you know, being a podcast host or being a broadcast host or doing radio or doing, you know, whatever or editing. I think it's, you know, one of those situations where I wanted to just kind of, you know, just be as well-rounded as possible. Because one thing about the industry is it's, it's one of those situations where whenever you're trying to, you know, you know, meet somebody up for a job or try to pitch yourself to somebody that you really feel you know, can really get you a job because so many of these jobs that are in the sports industry is really about who, you know, it's not necessarily about what, you know. So when it's something where you're trying to really pitch yourself as far as like being in the industry, you know, and you could say, okay, I write, I do broadcast, I do this, I do this, 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 that, and the third, then it's, it just really makes you all the more attractive to, you know, to anybody, because you just never know exactly what it is that, you know, that somebody could very well be, you know, looking for. Like one thing that I've, you know, I learned for sure, and I'm just going to, you know, throw a couple of places out there. Like, it could be one of those situations where you could be trying to get a job at, say that at, say the AJC. And then it'd be one of those situations where you may be trying to get a job for the Fort Wayne paper or the Indianapolis paper. And then it's one of those things you think, okay, I didn't land the job at the AJC, but I landed the job in Indy with my same exact credentials and my same exact cover letter because they may have been looking for something different than what the AJC may very well have been looking for. And I think also, as far as sports journalism is concerned, I think another one of the bits of advice that I would definitely have is if you have the means to get to as many games as possible and as many events as possible, get to those events because you know, it, it's one of those situations where, you know, you have some, and I think this is especially a, uh, an issue with some bloggers out there, but you got some people out there that will literally just go ahead. They may just watch a game and they'll literally just wait for the stats to come out. And that may be all fine and good, but I feel like that you develop your credibility when you go to games, you develop your credibility when you talk to coaches and you talk to players and you get, you know, and you get pictures and you get photos of the game where you get headshots of the players afterwards. So I think it's one of those situations where I think that if you can get to as many games as, you know, as you possibly can, because sometimes we can't always get to games, but if you can get to as many games as possible, then by all means get to them because that's a way to build up not just credibility, but also, also relationships with those that you cover. That's a pretty damn good advice right there. Mm -mm. I try. <laughs> I definitely try. Like, you know, and, and that's the thing, you know, like, you know, I've been, you know, this is my, you know, 2022 is going to be like my 10th year that I've been writing more or less on a professional level. And it seems like that these years have gone by really, really, really fast. But, you know, as much as I'm, you know, imparting, you know, advice to the next group of, dare I say, Akeem Balaam's, it's one of those situations where, you know, I'm also, you know, trying to still learn myself. Like, you know, I still consider myself a young cat in this industry. And so it's one of those situations where I kind of, you know, just, you know, sort of just had to kind of take my own advice while at the same time, you know, just, you know, remembering what I've learned and just trying to be better every day. Yeah, that's the, that's the best thing that you can do is just try to be better, better than it was yesterday. Just try to, you know, try, for, try to be better each and every day one of the best things that you can do for your own personal self, no matter what career that you possibly in, and, you know, and I'll, and I'll go ahead and say this too, you know, Akeem, I think, you know, I think you're a solid dude, man. I think you got, you still got an incredible future ahead of you. Um, and I, you know, I, you know, I, I will be on the lookout cause I, I feel that you got some big things coming, coming soon. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, you know, even this year, um, you know, with um, with uh, Prep Network and Prep Girls Hoops, um, it's one of those situations where I signed up to be one of their regional scouts for their 
um, for their circuit events this upcoming summer and, and spring. So uh, I'm going to be going to, you know, some of their events. Like they got an event in Bradenton, ironically, at the IMG Academy, at the which is the same place that the WNBA held its wobble season at the IMG Academy bubble in 2020. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be going to places like Gatlinburg, um, Atlanta. Um, where else am I going to be going to? Daytona Beach, uh, Chicago, um, Omaha, Nebraska, Council Bluffs. So I got some plans, you know, you know, coming up as far as like this spring and summer. And uh, I feel like it's something where it'll just kind of be a bit of a, you know, a springboard as far as just expanding, you know, what I can do. Because I feel like at this point, I've done you know, a lot as far as locally and regionally, and now I'm ready to take the act national. All right. Like I said, we're going to be on the lookout. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. I like it. Yeah. 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 Uh, John, you got anything else? No. Okay. I mean, he said, he said he was a young guy. So I'm like, of course you're a young guy, especially in, in, you know, journalism. Like, you know, you could write till you're 70 if you want to. So, I mean, yeah. you got plenty of, you got plenty of time to be a young guy, you know, so you're, you're good there. You're good in that regard. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, true. Yeah, you, so true. Yeah. Like I think about uh, this guy uh, who writes for, uh, Ooh, one of the people I, I love to follow is Vincent Goodwill. Uh, he's a senior writer for uh, for the NBA at, over at Yahoo. Um, I, don't, I don't know, but it, I just think about all these people that has tons and tons of experience in the industry, and they literally write for for like forever. Yeah, forever. Like they don't, yeah. they, you know, like once you're in the game, like you you there. So, but yeah, all right, we're gonna go ahead and, and go, go ahead and get started with our rapid fire segment. So it's the game within the game uh, segment. So my very first question is: Are you ready to play? Oh, always, always, absolutely. All right, so here we go. Um, chocolate chip cookies, oatmeal raisin, sugar cookies, oatmeal chocolate chip, or snickerdoodle? Chocolate chip all the way. And one place that has very underrated chocolate chip cookies, Starbucks. Try those cho- <laughs> uh, chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> okay. Well, I've, I've gotten, I've gotten uh, the, the, the chocolate chip cookies from Subway. Those are, those are pretty good. Wait, wait. Oh, really? <laughs> So we got uh-huh. Subway and, and Starbucks on the two two fast food places <laughs> Look, we got to try. Again, yes. again, see, okay. uh, again, Subway makes underrated chocolate chip cookies and I'm oatmeal. I'm not gonna cookies. say they. I'm not gonna say they. I'm not gonna say they. No, we're not gonna. You go know there. what you're missing out on, man. I might try the Starbucks coffee uh, cookie before I try the um, Subway one. I'm gonna just. That's mm-hmm. not, not a chance. Not a chance. No, see, this is smart dude right here. You were smart. Man. <laughs> <laughs> So your next question is TV shows or movies? Mm, probably you have to lean towards movies. I haven't really had much time for either, but probably one of those things, maybe today I would probably say movies, but probably maybe back in the day, I lean more towards TV shows. What's your, what's one of your favorite movies? Oh man. Like, Wow, I I got I got so many. I could I could hardly I could hardly name. <laughs> oh my well, God. give me give me a top five. Then. Give me a top five. Top five. Um, okay. to if if I gave you if I give a top five, they probably just be they probably just be all sports movies. Um, I don't know if maybe I could necessarily do like a top five, but I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to think of a I'm gonna try to think of a top one before, and I think it may very well be on the tip of my tongue, but I'm gonna think I'm gonna try to think of a top one. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. I know one of my one of one of my favorites is Remember the Titans. So easy, mm-hmm. easy, easy choice for the family. Oh, yeah. Elena. That's definitely on the top of a lot of people's list. Yeah, that and uh, Hall I would of say Knights. Glory Road. Glory Road from a sports movie wise. Glory Road is probably one of my favorites. Uh, I never yeah. seen Glory Road. What? Believe it or not, yeah. I never seen Glory Road. What? <laughs> yeah, that, I don't even think like, what? What you missing out on? What? Yeah, you, you know, it's Texas Western. You know, old school. I mean, it's it shows the just you know an NCAA team that Cinderella team that doesn't get the coverage in a prejudice America or you know still at the time whatever the case is you know but going through that process beating 
Kentucky at the time with uh, Adolph Rupp. Like, it, it's a good movie. It's, it's, it's a good movie, man. That's all I can say. Good movie. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm, I'm going to put that in my list of movies to definitely watch. Good. good yeah. Good. Um, who's your favorite five in the WNBA? Favorite five? Oh, you, 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 th- you throwing some you throwing some hard ones at me to, to end everything. Like, Fave five, I would probably have to say, um, that's a good one because I could think of so many names. Probably Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart, um, Sue Bird is definitely, I think, probably certainly on that list. Candace Parker, Liz Cambage. I think those are probably the five for now. But it's one of those situations where I think that my list of five could probably be more of like a 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 1E, 1F, 1D. <laughs> so, so it's it's one of those things where it's like, you know, there's so many, you know, there's so many to name. Yeah, I respect that. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. So many to name, especially with all the talent in the WMA nowadays. A lot of talent. It's only going to get deeper next year, too. Right. <laughs> so true, okay. man. So true. <laughs> so I'll give you a give you a hypothetical well not a hypothetical who would you rather have candace parker or sue bird oh oh yowch um that's that's another good one that's another good one i don't know i mean gee i don't know i probably maybe i would probably have to lean slightly like 51 49 in the direction <laughs> just because she got four rings like uh, and just like i said that you know just like the the longevity and everything like that so i think i'd probably trust me when i say candace parker one of my favorite players but probably leaning in the direction of sue i don't know but it's it, it's 50 it's 51 49 either way gotcha. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's that's a tough question all right Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you this: Who would you rather, who would you rather start a franchise with, uh, Stewie or Maya Moore? Mm. Oh, uh-huh. mm. that's a good one. That is mm. a definitely a good one. I would probably lean in the direction of Maya Moore, and I think probably the only reason as to why I say that is because like both both are great players in their regard, but it's one of those situations where I just think like. You know, I, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, the thing, the thing that sort of always just kind of gets me about Stewie is I want to see how Seattle does, you know, after she, like, if if, 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 if it turns out Sue Bird retires after this year, then I think it'll be interesting to see how the storm will progress pretty much building a team around Stewie. We've seen what the Minnesota Lynx look like building a super team for so many years around, around Maya Moore when they have their dynasty. But it's one of those, it's one of those, another one of those 51, 49 type questions, but I got to lean, I got to lean Maya Moore. I got to lean Maya Moore. And, and it's also kind of having me choose because it's almost like, okay, Maya Moore is from Georgia. Stewie's from New York state. So it's like <laughs> kind of like my two states right there. So, you know, so, uh, but yeah, like, you know, you want to talk about those, those are definitely two of the goats right there. Maya Moore and Stewie. Oh yeah, for sure. Mm. But you, can, you can't go wrong with either one of them. You really can't go wrong with that. Oh, oh yeah. No, you can't like, you yeah. know, if those, if those are my options, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sitting pretty, pretty you know with either one so it doesn't matter even if it's good i, one, wish, two, I slick wish i could sign highs. both of them i slick yeah. wish i could sign both of them but you know they probably wouldn't leave a lot of cap space to sign a bench right nope <laughs> yeah. you got no one on your bench <laughs> right <laughs> i have a bunch of draft picks on the bench <laughs> pretty much i have a bunch of draft picks on the bench side of rookie contracts <laughs> yeah we talk, we talk we talk a second and third round draft picks not even the first damn but hey you know what when you if you're able to build a team around say maya moore and brianna stewart like they make the rest of the team better so it is what it is that's true that's true yeah 
So, okay, let's see. If you could go pro in any sport, what would it be? Ooh, believe it or not, I know we've done a lot of basketball talk, but if I could go pro in any sport, I'd probably go, I'd probably want to go pro in baseball because, you know, one thing about baseball players is that they sign, they sign some pretty big money contracts. Now I know basketball is kind of, you know, is kind of catching up to it in that regard, but, you know, I just kind of think, you know, I, I, I would just kind of think like Kyler Murray, because I remember it was one of those situations where Kyler Murray had the option to go pro in either baseball or football. And, and I think he made the smart decision to eventually, you know, go pro in, um, you know, go pro in, well, maybe not the smart decision to go pro in football, but if I was, you know, if I, I could choose probably bat, probably baseball more so than anything else. Cause I played little league baseball when I was, you know, when I was younger. So I have a familiarity with it. Yeah, if I'm Kyle, I'm picking baseball. Now, granted, he probably well, we'll he could he could have done both, but he contract have. contractually he couldn't because they signed they put it contractually in his contract for the Cardinals that he couldn't play baseball. So I mean, he could have possibly did both in the off season if he wanted to, which is it's been done before. But you know, uh-huh. teams and injuries and things of that nature. Yeah, no, it just it's what it is. Exactly, exactly. Like, you know, give me give me baseball over football any day of the week. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> okay. Uh your favorite sports moment that you have either seen or witnessed. Oh, um their favorite favorite sports moment. Mm, so many of them, so many of them. Now, I wasn't necessarily Obviously, I wasn't necessarily there because I don't think I'd be able to afford Super Bowl tickets. But my favorite sports moment in my years watching sports was probably Eli Manning to David Tyree, because, you know, I grew up in a I grew up in a New York Giants household. My family is full of New York Giants fans. My oldest brother, by the way, here's here's a little bit about my oldest brother, Bobby. He is actually a New York Giants fan and a philadelphia eagles fan that's a very unique mix but and 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 i remember one time he was telling me like i remember one time like in the early 90s he threw a super bowl party when the giants played the bills in the super bowl but my favorite moment would probably have to be eli manning to david tyree because just thinking about the 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 magnitude of that moment considering the fact that the Giants were major underdogs in that Super Bowl that year, and the fact that Brady and the Patriots were going for the undefeated season, they were going for the greatest season in history, 19 and 0, move over, um, move over Miami Dolphins, all that good jazz. And the fact that he threw that pass and David Tyree literally caught it on the side of his helmet, and then the and then Eli throwing the Plex Burris in the in the end zone, it was just like like that's a moment that especially for me being a native New Yorker, like I could legit like play over like over and over and over and over. If there was one moment that I could literally watch for hours and never get tired of it, it would be that cat. It would be that pass, that catch, and that drive. <laughs> I can uh, never get tired of that, man. Oh man. Uh Juwan, do you ever get tired of that moment? <laughs> you just looking at me like, oh, like really? <laughs> <laughs> Must I go in further details? <laughs> so so can you real quick just let you know Juwan is a is a Patriots fan, so um oh. so, so that's why he he went with the no comment approach. You know, you you uh, call you call, you call a post game exiting out of the stadium, and so you know he got shades on, coat on, ready to go. He got no comment for you. Hey, I mean, you still you still won you still won six you know Super Bowls with Brady and Belichick, and plus you know. Hey, it's one of those situations where you still get the opportunity to clown Atlanta Falcons fans about, you know, 28 to three. Yeah, but we will definitely we, remember we, that one. <laughs> yeah, but we, we, you know, we, we lost, at least, we should at least split, I think one of them, but I mean, you got the, the Tyree catch and then Mario Manningham that year 
or two after that. You know, it, it, it's it, I, it just is what it is. I, I can't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like you just reopened a wound on him. You know, they just got bounced <laughs> off the playoff too. So, like, it, it's, flashbacks, yeah. memories. I mean, yeah. it's not even a wound at this point. It's just, it's just that thing that you are, our safety. I mean, granted, Rodney Harrison was one of the, you know, just he's a Hall of Famer within his own right. But boy, why try to pry the ball away from the man in midair while he's he's flexing? Like that doesn't make sense logically to do what he did. But at, <laughs> don't get me started on him today. That's just not what I'm. We're not gonna do that. It, it was a great moment for the for Giants fans. I'm glad that they got it. Good for them. Um, next question. That's what we're talking about. Next question. Uh, <laughs> Um, if you could be a hype man for any artist, who would it be? Oi, um, if I could be a hype man for any artist, see, the thing is, I'm not really all that good of a hype man. Like, it's one of those things where I don't know, like, it's probably one of those things where I wish somebody would probably go ahead and maybe be a hype man for me. Because <laughs> if someone would go ahead and try to be a hype man for me and I was an artist, like, that would be one of those things that I would just kind of, uh, you know, that would probably just, you know, get me all revved up and everything like that. But but I, I don't know, because I couldn't see myself as a good hype man, but I don't know. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. It depends, though. Okay. What, what depends on? On what? Just. I, I don't anything? know. It just, I don't know. It just kind of depends on, you know, just really me being a me being a good hype man which i know for sure i probably wouldn't necessarily be a good one but but you know it is like i said it is what it is what can you do makes sense Mm -hmm. so if you could take over any organization in the world no matter it doesn't matter who it is it could be chase bank the government we've heard what the ioc Mm -hmm. What yeah. business or what organization, Red Cross, if you want to do nonprofit, what organization would you take over and why? Oh, um, you know, this one may not necessarily be all that difficult. I could see myself taking over just about any single local transportation organization in the country because we have a lot of transit organizations in the country that you know, it's one of those situations where I just look at certain cities and it's almost like, now, obviously you got your New Yorks and your Chicago's and your, and your Phillies and your DC's that are just exceptions to the rule, but it's, you know, and I talk about this with friends a lot, but it's one of those situations where I just think that I just want to just take over some of these organizations and just really do what I can to make sure to expand transportation into some of these, you know, into some of these underserved areas and into some of these smaller towns. So I think that that's probably, that's probably one of the things that I would probably definitely, you know, just, just want to do, because that's another one of my passions is travel. So, um, so I feel like if I could take over anything like that, I could probably, you know, take over anything, you know, on, you know, along, along that, or if I could say. All right, because I know we definitely need some help with our public transportation here in Fort Wayne. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. Do we? Mm-hmm. I think we do. I, I was look. Yeah. It, it it may be been that may be only because coming from like from like Chicago to like Fort Wayne, it just it, it's well. Yeah, difference. I mean, we don't like everybody can that's drive here. Like that's the, the I know. Thing. Like, yeah, I know. Every everyone drives here. That's why you know, there's no really no need for it. So. I'm like, it, I'm yeah. I I encourage any city to really have a good public transportation system. So big facts, big facts. Like, you know, and that's you know, that's exactly why I want to go ahead, why I would love to do something like that. Yeah, it's and it's not even like just about the buses and stuff, it's also about like, you know, cycling paths. Like there's so many streets that they've done a better job over the recent years. So they start adding a path for, you know, cycling, you know. So yeah. But we, enough about Fort Wayne. Um Akeem, <laughs> Akeem, man. Um, you know, last question, but the hardest question of them all. You know, how can people keep up with your career and keep up with everything that you have going forward? Oh yeah. Um so they can uh follow me. They can follow me. Um 
um, at Akeem Balaam, which is A-K-I-E-M-B-A-I-L-U-M uh, on Twitter and on the gram, uh, as well as, you know, follow what I do at Beyond the W, follow what I do at uh, at Prep Girls Hoops. Uh, I'm also planning on later on this year uh, launching my own uh, you know, website as well. That's going to have more of my own, uh, exclusive content and things like that. So, so yeah, there's, uh, there, there's definitely ways to certainly, you know, just follow me and keep up with me and keep in touch with me. And if all else fails, just, uh, just Google my name. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That, that's the best way to do it. Especially, if you, <laughs> especially if you pop up, I don't even have to search through like millions of different people have named up to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's my problem. Somebody out there. Cause there could be somebody out there that may have a, like a, like a, a name. Cause when I introduce myself to certain people, they're like, Oh, how can I follow you on social media? And they have a hard time trying to follow me. So I understand that sometimes it's one of those things that comes with the territory. Oh yeah, most definitely. But, um, but yeah, that concludes today's episode. Um, for all the fans, listeners, subscribers out there, go ahead. We appreciate all the likes and subscribes and reviews that we get. Uh, please sure, please be sure to rate us on your favorite podcast platform, whether it be Apple, Google, Spotify. We're on all pat- platforms. Um, just punching capturing the game podcast. We're also on your favorite social media platform, whether it be TikTok, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Instagram, Twitter, um, it just labeled with CTG underscore podcast. Again, that's CTG underscore podcast on whatever your favorite uh, social media platform. Uh, Keen, it's been wonderful talking with you for this past couple of hours, man. Past hour and some change, but definitely dope episode. Definitely uh, great that I got a chance to, to interview you. Well, we both great that we had a, a chance to interview you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely glad I was able to, you know, I was able to join, you know, so, um, you know, so yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a blast. <laughs>